All right. How's it going, guys? Good. Uh, welcome to the Da Vinci Institute, another Da Vinci Institute speaker series. Um, so we all know that artificial intelligence is going to be a technology that will have a huge impact on the future. And a growing body of researchers are beginning to take seriously the idea that we should think about how this technology is going to be deployed, how it will change over time, and what impact that will have on, on humans. Um, machine ethics is a field which concerns itself with questions ranging from how should driverless cars weigh pedestrians against passengers if a crash is going to happen, all the way up to what should we tell a super intelligence to want? What do we want it to want? And, and what will its behaviors be in light of the answer to that question? So Steve Commerce is going to talk to us about some sort of the cutting edge in, uh, in super intelligence and in machine ethics and the interface of those two fields. He's got a PhD in computer science and he runs the, uh, he's getting a PhD in computer science and he runs the, uh, the Fort Collins, is it the MIRI group? Is that what they are? Correct. Yeah, machine. the Machine Intelligence Research Institute MIRI group in Fort Collins. So he and a bunch of other people will talk about this all day. So we've got, we're in good hands mm -hmm. for this topic. So um, yeah, without further ado, Steve. Okay, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> and uh, as mentioned, so I, I was a computer engineer. I did computer chip design for uh, most of my career, almost three decades. Worked at Hewlett Packard, National Semiconductor Advanced Micro Devices. Really interested in trying to help make the next generation uh, high performance compute. And in part because you know I'm interested in, in moving things towards uh, machine automation and uh, seeing where, where computers can take us. In the last few years, it's become obvious it's a software problem now. There's a lot of advances coming out of machine intelligence research, uh, a lot of new software breakthroughs. There's still hardware help that's coming along. There's hardware designs that are, are making compute more efficient, but a lot of it is a, a software problem. So that's, that's sort of my background. Right now, I'm working on my PhD uh, at Colorado State University. And I've been interested in this field my whole career, sort of been watching it on the sidelines, but I have been diving into it much deeper in the last few years uh, with the Machine Intelligence Research Institute and the readings. So, you know, first off, you know, what are, what is artificial superintelligence and what is sort of the background behind artificial intelligence? And I'd like to start out the discussion by looking at, at where hardware is been. <coughs> And what this chart is showing uh, from top500.org is the very highest performance computer every year for the last couple decades going back to 1994. And you can see you know, we crossed the teraflop boundary back in oh, about 97. And now we're up here at about 100 petaflops. So it's an exponential growth. This is a logarithmic curve. And uh, it sort of it was getting about 3x faster every two years until about 2010. You can see it sort of flattens out a little. Um, you know, you might have been reading in the paper, there's a lot of challenges with computer geometries making it smaller and smaller. Keeping the hardware on the furious pace it's been for many decades is pretty challenging. Uh, Moore's Law uh, has been going on since basically the 50s. And we've been doubling the amount of transistors we can put on a silicon chip about every two years. So this doubling has been going on and it creates this really interesting line. Meanwhile, we've also been using computers to explore the game of chess. So people have been using uh, programs to explore artificial intelligence and figure out what we can sort of program them to do. Back in the 60s, uh, you know, a typical chess program could play chess relatively poorly. The chess ELO rating is a way to evaluate how well uh, a program or a person plays chess. And it started out sort of a, a mediocre player, uh, got a little bit better. By the time I was playing computer chess, it, it could beat me most of the time, um, getting up above 2,000. The best human player in the world, uh, well, Kasparov, I think, has recently been superseded. But uh, Kasparov was beaten by a computer uh, back in the late 90s, and that's a, it was an ELO rating of about 2850. <clears throat> and now the computers keep getting better. So there was nothing magical about crossing the human barrier that, that you can see in this curve, which has continued to increase. And now we have computer programs, 2015, that out, you know, score much higher than any human ever has. 
Now, there was another researcher, and uh, Jay Levitt wrote a book, Genius at Chess, and he tried to look at, you know, if you take people with different IQ levels, and you, you know, you look at, at the chess champions, and you look at people who've played in chess clubs, and people who've tried to play chess well for a number of years, where do they sort of plateau at? And this is a real fuzzy number, right? This obviously isn't an equation, but <laughs> approximately, you know, someone with 100 IQ tended to have about a 200 ELO rating if they played for a few years and studied seriously. Someone with a 200 IQ, which is basically right at the edge of, you know, the top billionth person, I and mean, that's sort of the highest that, that humans get to, is at about a 3,000 level. So it sort of matches. And what's interesting, I think, is just how smoothly this curve follows the exponential growth of computer hardware. Now, there are other ways to look at, at intelligence relative to compute power. There's uh, some people um, who are learning disadvantaged get more time to take SAT tests. And you can sort of see that you see a similar effect where you, you give sort of a doubling in time or a doubling in compute power and you get, you know, maybe 10 IQ points or so out of that. So this has been going on for a while, and, you know, but this is chess, this isn't general intelligence. So here we have uh, something, more, talking more about general intelligence now. Um, you know, when we think about humanity and where we sit on the, the intelligence scale, this is a, a chart that came out of Wait But Why, which is a really interesting article out there on the internet website. And they have a good article about artificial superintelligence. And you look at this, you know, here we've got an ant down here, chicken, chimpanzee, human. And you know, there's there's room up here for for super intelligences. And when you think about you know where chimpanzees are relative to humans, you know, I've I've read stuff that they're maybe third or or three or four year old level of intelligence, you know, as compared to a human child. So they're sort of on our same scale. Not, they're above chickens, to be sure. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you think a chimpanzee maybe has an IQ of 20, well, we went from, a, you know, a, about an IQ of 20 in 1960 to about an IQ of 100 in 1980. It took us about 20 years. Yeah. So you're referring to the ant as itself or as the hive? Right. Yeah, good point. I'm referring it to itself. Yeah, because they do have some interesting behaviors when they actually group together. Could be hard to sort of analyze that. At the same time, humans are much more capable than their group together. Can you check your ears? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> People can hear me, but I'm not. There, is that better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure if that was recording well on the, the video. Anyway, so here we are uh, talking about superintelligence. And again, if you think about how long it's taken for uh, computers to get better at chess, I like to think, I'm one of the believers in sort of a slow general intelligence path. Um, I think that this will be something like what will happen maybe 100 years from now with super intelligence. Um, you know, maybe in 2060, let's just add 100 years to all of these. In 2060, we'll have something that's generally maybe as intelligent as a chimpanzee, so a, a helper robot at your house that you can ask to uh, you know, empty the dishwasher, mow the lawn, go out and collect go groceries, I uh, guess. Just curious about your graph. The uh, last tail, it seems to take a slight faster curve. It, it did jump up a little bit, and you know I couldn't find the best data there because people aren't really competing here in the same way. There's, you know, there's AlphaGo, which was an interesting breakthrough in artificial intelligence where they sort of got it to learn itself. My point being that I think it's going to go a lot faster than 100 years before they're sanctioned. I, that, we can talk about that. And that actually, I wanted to mention that, right? So I, I tend to think that it's going to be fairly slow. And that's partly because I think the problem of intelligence is very difficult. And even if you had an artificial intelligence that was as smart as a person that ran on a Google, uh, or some warehouse somewhere took $10 million, it's not going to materially contribute to the advance of the next machine more than trained humans would, because it costs $10 million. Right? So you're going to get this sort of continued growth, in my opinion. 
Now there are people, and this segues into the upcoming talk, <laughs> who think that there could be breakthroughs, that we could see something where once we get, once we figure it out, it'll go much faster. And you know, we could go from something that's as smart as a chimpanzee to something that's as smart as a human in a year, and then something that's a lot smarter in a year after that, and so on. Now, so that segues to some extent into this next book. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I threw this in the middle. <laughs> so um, I wanted to describe what artificial general intelligence was, right? So we talked about chess. So artificial general intelligence um, means when you think about, again, what a, what a young child might be capable of and what an artificial general intelligence with an IQ of 30 or 40 can be capable of. You can ask it to do things. Um, you know, you could certainly imagine evaluating options to reserve hotels, air for and automobiles for travel. We have bots that try to do that now, but you can imagine them getting better and better and sort of understanding what you want and trying to negotiate. Certainly a helper robot in the home that could understand the home, make sure it doesn't step on the cat, you know, <laughs> know what kind of food you like. Um, that, those are examples of sort of low level but general intelligence where they can solve general problems. Um, in a lot of ways an AGI might seem like a, a young child early on, but something that's different about AGI versus a child is we already have computers that outcompete us on a variety of tasks, right? Chess, for example. So the first AGI that you could call generally intelligent is probably not going to be as good at humans as, at a lot of things, but it's going to be way better than humans at a certain category. Um, you know, likely AGI is going to happen after we have good self-driving cars. So, you know, the, the first AGI will be great at driving cars <laughs> and great at playing chess, presumably. Um, so when you think about it, and, you know, as we talk about superintelligence, uh, AGIs, their, their strengths and weaknesses are going to be very different than what we're used to, and they're going to be a lot more foreign than, like, alien intelligence from outer space might be. Yes? You can say that early AGI will occur after AI is that driving cars better than so that's an interesting benchmark. For me. So is that is that a like a is that a common way of phrasing this idea? Because that seems like a narrow way to it. Right. Well, that's the point. AGI is artificial general intelligence. So having a generally intelligent machine that you can tell it to you know go out and figure out how to build a small house in the woods, you know, and it can figure it out is is going to occur after we have specific successes at specific problems. So we've already out, outperformed humans at, at chess. Um, some image recognition tasks, computers are better than humans. And uh, So as opposed to artificial niche intelligence. Yes, right, right. So general means they can sort of, you can communicate them the way you would with a human, but they'll have strengths and weaknesses, right? One might expect they, they wouldn't understand certain emotional topics as well, but they're getting better at that. But they'll be better at certain analytical things. Than humans. So it'll be a curious time. <laughs> so when you think about artificial general intelligence, right down here we have the biological range. And uh, this is, again, a, a nice graph from the Wait But Why folks. And they're pointing out, you know, here's your ant, here's your chicken, here's your chimpanzee, your human. <laughs> That's what we tend to think of when we think of what intelligence is. And even when we start talking about artificial superintelligence, right, we think of things that are just a bit smarter than people. But there's no reason that curve is going to stop, right? And that's the point of this is when you have something that's not just smarter than us relative to an ant, but smarter than us relative to a rock, you know, or, you know, and where do you draw the line, right? It's, uh, it's capable of, of thinking thoughts about mathematics, planning, its understanding of the universe, its goals will be so foreign to us that it's hard to imagine. Now, we'd like to hope, though, that throughout this process, you know, we can keep the ASIs friendly with both themselves and us because we want future of life to be a flourishing one and happy one. So given this background, um, that's sort of what artificial superintelligence is and where some of the challenges are. Uh, a great book to read about this topic was written by Nick Bostrom, and the book is called Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. Uh, Nick 
has thought about this uh, for quite a while, and uh, he's part of the Future of Humanity Institute, which is maybe not unlike the Da Vinci Institute here, you know, trying to think about how can we help make sure that, that the future of humanity unrolls well as technology continues to advance. Um, and he's, you know, he's been recognized sort of at a global level for, for some of his thoughts and challenges. So, so when he puts his mind onto this problem, you know, he brings a lot of experience, he's talked to a lot of people about it, and uh, tested a lot of these ideas. So one of the, uh, the intriguing things that comes out of this, <coughs> his analysis, is, is the idea that his definition of intelligence, which we can talk about as the, the night goes on, is uh, the capacity for instrumental reason. So when you want to accomplish a goal, being able to intelligently think about your different options and how they play together and, and coming up with a plan and a strategy, that's what his definition of intelligence is. So it doesn't in particular mean that you're self-aware or conscious, for example. It just means you can you know, plan and organize well. So, and one of the examples he likes to use to sort of bring this home is the idea that um, you know, the final goals and intelligence could be completely different. If you ask a machine to make a lot of paper clips, or you ask a machine to make a lot of widgets, whatever that widget is. <coughs> yes? Would you mind uh, defining ortho? Oh, orthogonal. Something I can't think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so orthogonal means, you know, what it's saying here is uh, intelligence and final goals. So the idea that, that something can be intelligent and have an arbitrary goal, they're not they're not related to each other. Orthogonal means unrelated. So they're they're not related to each other. You, you might have something that's extremely intelligent but seems to be doing something that, that seems like a stupid final goal. But if it doesn't know how to evaluate its own goals, <laughs> it's just going to intelligently strive to, to meet that goal. So that's that's the example of the paperclip maximizer. I mean, why would you want to turn the whole Earth into paperclips? <laughs> you probably wouldn't. <laughs> but if you programmed a machine to do that and gave it the ability to think and plan and mine and build, you know, automated factories, you know, it might slowly take over the world with paperclips and and not even realize that was a bad. Well, this this is his his one of his theses, and we'll talk about this because I agree it's it's an interesting thing to discuss. <coughs> and let's see. So again, yeah, the goal of maximizing paper clips is, is an illustrated <laughs> example. <laughs> Probably not something we'd actually try to do. But his point is, you don't have to have a malevolent machine to create something that <coughs> might cause a lot of harm. If you just create something that's really powerful and is sort of amoral, you know, it's not good or bad. It still could turn out pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> so now, you know, let's let's talk about this a little bit. So, you know, so humans um, evolved their sort of sense of ethics um, through the selfish gene. Um, you know, basically just figuring out what what makes life better in the next generation. And humans evolved a set of altruistic behaviors and sort of you help me, I'll help you. And, and a very friendly sort of cooperation because that's what helped them be successful um, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> so, you know, and, and we have the ability to question our own goals. So, you know, would, a, would an intelligent machine inherently get to the point where it questions its own goals? If you ask it to make paperclip maximizer and it got smart enough where it was actually like negotiating to buy nickel mines from humans, it would have to understand their motivations. Maybe at some point it would realize, why am I making paper clips? You know? <laughs> would, it, would it be smart enough to become self-aware? Um, it's not necessarily obvious that a super intelligent machine has to be self-aware, but it would seem, you know, I can see arguments for it. <laughs> um, so then the question, you know, part of what I want to talk about in the last half of this talk is uh, if you come up with goals for a super intelligence, are, can you come up with stable goals? Goals that, when it thinks about them, even with a 10,000 IQ, it'll still decide, yes, these are still reasonable goals. And how do you make sure that, that you've got that sort of stability in your goal set? So, um, now getting back to uh, Nick Bostrom's book again. <coughs> so he did talk about, you know, how can you predict 
what a super intelligence might do, right? We can't imagine what it's like to have a 10,000 IQ, but we can try to imagine how to build something that will behave itself <laughs> if it was super smart. Um, so, you know, predictability through design competence is the idea that uh, if, if smart programmers program it correctly, then it should continue to strive for the goals that it tried to set up for. Uh, predictability through inheritance is the idea that if humans can upload into silicon, or if we can, you know, put our hats on and have sort of connections to the internet through our uh, brain-computer interfaces, you know, maybe humans themselves will become part of this future super intelligence. So that's one possible way to uh, have some sense of, of their motivations. And then the last one is that he goes into in the next slide, I'll talk about it, uh, predictability through convergent instrumental reasons. So the idea is that no matter what your high level goal is, you're likely to have certain low level goals that you share with it, you share in common. So this leads to what's called the instrumental convergence thesis, which is the idea that Whatever the goal is, whether it's, you know, let's colonize Mars or let's maximize paper clips or make, let's make sure humans are all happy, you know, there's certain instrumental values that you would expect any super intelligent machine would have. One is self-preservation. If, if you give it a goal and it wants to accomplish that goal, it's not going to be successful if it runs off a cliff or, you know, lets itself get hurt. So there's a certain amount of that. Even if it's not selfish, it still wants to survive. Goal content integrity, this is the idea that if the machine figures out how to make itself more intelligent, it wants, it has the same problem we have. It wants to make sure that when it creates a more intelligent version of itself so that its goal can be accomplished more effectively, it stays true to that goal. If the goal mutates, then it, it will feel like it had lost something. Yeah. We'll talk more about goals in the next few slides. Uh, cognitive enhancement, this is what we just talked about where, again, if you have some goal, whatever that goal might be, you know, take good care of your kids, you know, <laughs> um, you, know you might go out and get an education, come uh, learn stuff, you know, and make yourself smarter. In the case of an artificial super intelligence, it literally could make itself smarter, what we expect, you know, build better hardware, download, you know, into more copies of itself. Uh, technological perfection, so this is just, you know, it, it doesn't want to make technical errors. If it's, if it's trying to accomplish a goal, it, it doesn't want. It wants to make sure it understands the world well enough to act correctly. That's sort of the goal there. And resource acquisition. So, <clears throat> again, paperclip maximizer is another example. If it wants to turn the whole planet into paperclips, it's going to take over all the resources. At some point, if you have more complex goals, like you know, create a beautiful world for humans to live, you know, there'd be a point where. You don't want the whole world to be covered with roses because there's other things people want besides the roses. <laughs> it, would, it would have a more complex understanding of, of how to balance them. But still, it wants to acquire resources to accomplish it. So, and now let's let's talk about that a little bit. So, you know, one of the things I, I mentioned with regards to human evolution is that we evolved to have a certain desire for cooperation and ability to cooperate. And is that something that a super intelligence would, would naturally have? And that's sort of a question. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think Nick Bostrom might say not necessarily, but I have to wonder if, if you're trying to accomplish a complex enough goal, like perhaps uh, colonizing the stars, at some point you're going to have individual copies of your artificial sentience <laughs> that can't communicate with each other very quickly because of the speed of light. So you have to, at some point, be able to trust a copy of yourself. And just that statement, to me, implies some understanding of ethics and mutual benefit that you would hope it could apply to humans, <laughs> as well as to copies of itself. You know, just the way there are some humans who, you know, won't step on an ant or, you know, take uh, some vegetarians you know, who don't want to harm animals. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, let's see. So if, if you had an instrumental goal, again, thinking amorally here, thinking just if the machine got out of control and it wants to maximize paper clips, but it wants to start spreading out to the, the galaxy, so now it has to understand how to make a copy of itself that it can trust, 
with the fact that it had to do that, give it some empathy for, oh wait, the humans were trying to do that too. And oh, there's these creatures I've been stepping on. Maybe I shouldn't step on them, right? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, would it would it start to learn empathy? Uh, probably not. It's probably not something we can hope for, <laughs> I would guess. We have to program it in on purpose. So and now another topic that Nick talked about, which I think is very interesting. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay, about halfway through. So the idea here is, you know, if you have something that has bad goals and at some point it realizes maybe my goals aren't ideal, what kinds of things might change them? And uh, one of them is, is an area he calls social signaling. And just briefly, the idea here is if, if the machine is trying to negotiate with other humans, it might make agreements and say, well, uh, I keep using the paperclip macro. <laughs> just an easy idea, you know. If it wants to, you know, buy a mine in some country, then it, the humans might want it to do something, and the humans might say, "And by the way, this is the only place where we're going to let you mine nickel. Is that okay? We want, you know, to have farms and houses and stuff, <laughs> so it don't take over the rest of the country." And you know, that's that's an example where it might agree to limit its goals so that it can accomplish a more short-term goal. So it might sort of negotiate its goals into a different. Um, also, social preferences, if it's taught, if it's a little more sort of aware of human desires and it's been programmed to pay attention to what humans ask of it, you know, just the social preferences of humans themselves might make it change its goals. Maybe it's originally built to, you know, provide housing for all humans on the planet, you know, but then some humans decide, I don't want a house, I want, you know, I want to live in an RV or something. <laughs> then it has to say, okay, well, I'm going to classify an RV as a house now. It's, it's adjusts its goals based on what social preferences are. Um, preferences concerning its old content. So, is there a question here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, if it's able to copy itself, aren't we now creating competition for resources? Yeah. Um, so, well, even, even if it keep, maintains its goal, well, it's now going to have competition. But part of what we want is to make sure that it, its goals align with ours, right? This is the alignment problem. And if it's creating a copy of itself, then hopefully, you know, let's say we come up with a, a $1 million computer that can, you know, do some amazing things. If it creates a copy of itself, hopefully, and let's say its goal is, you know, to help <coughs> build a community, right? It, it's helping build a, an apartment building and, you know, it's, it's designing it, and planning it, and getting out the hammer and nails. And it says, I could do this more effectively if there were two of them. That's not bad. You know, it can help more people that way. But yeah, you certainly don't want it to create a trillion copies, <laughs> you know, and, and take over. I'm just thinking about the, the amount of resources that would be out there. Yeah. That it would, you know, there's only one line that we're using. We don't have to use it. No. And yeah. <coughs> I mean, I think just like humans have to think a little bit about sustainability. I think part of as we think about what we might want out of the super intelligence, we don't want to give it a simplistic goal that says, uh, you know, we want houses for everyone. Right? If, if the human population doesn't stabilize, houses for everyone becomes its own paperclip maximizer problem. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we can talk about it. Uh, as I go through the slides and talk about ethics, you know, I think we'll, we'll get on some of these ideas. Um, so, so I guess another idea is storage costs. So if, if the system is trying to accomplish a certain set of goals and the goals, it starts realizing that some of them are getting more complicated than others, it might make its own trade-offs as to which ones it's going to continue to pursue. So these are some of the concepts that, that Nick Bostrom was uh, exploring. And they're, they're interesting ideas to think about. Um, in summary, you know, the, the summary of the superintelligence books, we have the, the orthogonality thesis, which posits that you can have something that's really intelligent that's basically not self-aware. You can give it some arbitrary goal and it will pursue that uh, in an intelligent way. But yet instrumental convergence is the idea that any superintelligent machine is likely to have certain behaviors. And we talked about, you know, certainly self-preservation, acquiring resources, those kinds of things make sense. but would it, 
would self-awareness necessarily be part of self superintelligence? Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, would cooperation be part of superintelligence? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, I think there's, there's an area of sort of philosophy in here where people who've been thinking about, you know, what's the nature of consciousness for millennia <laughs> can actually contribute to this problem um, as we actually start building consciousness. What will they be thinking? And, you know, even, even instrumental values, if you think about, if, if you give it a sort of simplistic goal and then it gets smarter and more capable of accomplishing that goal, have you created a monster? That's, that's one of the problems. Or did you accidentally create a problem even without the goals? So now we'll segue. I don't know if people have a question or two on superintelligence, we can ask them, answer them. Uh, but I was going to start talking about ethics now. So the, the ethics problem, uh, ethics as sort of a philosophical study over the centuries has been broken up into two different areas, descriptive ethics and normative ethics. Descriptive ethics is just about how people behave and what they do, sort of a sociological study. Normative ethics is more about what people ought to do and what should the rules of behavior be. So this is the area that we're most interested in when we're thinking about how do we build a, a general intelligence or a super intelligence. And then meta-ethics is another topic you'll hear talked about, <coughs> and it, it deals with sort of a question of what's the point of ethics? You know, why do we even have ethics? What do things like good, good and bad mean, right and wrong? Um, you know, is it, it's, it's different than the study of, of physics and particles. It's like, well, what are we talking about, right? That's sort of a meta-ethics question. But again, when we drill down into normative ethics, uh, there's sort of three main areas, and we'll talk about all these and how superintelligence might interact with these sort of different ideas. Consequentialism is the idea, and you've probably heard this, the ends justifies the means, right? If, if you have a good goal, then even you know bad things you might do to accomplish that goal can be justified. And you know, any of these ethical systems probably have their their point examples where you could say, yeah, that was justified in this case. But you know, what's What's the best sort of overall goal? And the duty-based ethics is uh, deontology, and those are the rule-based ethics. So you know, the Ten Commandments, do unto others, but also Asimov's three laws of robotics would, could be considered sort of a rule-based ethics, what, what you're allowed <coughs> to do. Virtue ethics is uh, judges' actions based on how it develops good character traits. So virtue ethics is a little more about coming up with an internal idea of the state of being that you as a consciousness want to have and trying to act in a way that, that is in harmony with that. And this was explored a lot by Aristotle. So you know, these ideas are, are quite old <laughs> and people have been thinking about them and, and what they mean for how people behave for, for some time. These particular slides uh, come from out here from the slide that are there. So here's an example of sort of Aristotle's views when we're talking about virtue ethics. You know, what does that mean? I think people are familiar with sort of the deontology, rule-based ethics. Virtue ethics is, is a little fuzzier because it's trying to go after, you know, the, the ideal center. It's not just saying, if you go here, you've gone too far. It's like, well, what do you really want to be achieving? And so it looks at what they call the virtuous mean. So if you think along the, the line of, cur of courage, um, the ideal behavior would be something you might call courageous. If you don't have enough courage, then you're, you know, you've got cowardice uh, coming into play. But if you have too much courage, then you have rashness, right? You're willing to take risks that are inappropriate and ill-advised. And similarly, down the middle here, um, what's another good one? Uh, temperance, uh, maybe sincerity. So you know, being sincere, being honest, <clears throat> you know, if you um, are, are giving someone a compliment or you're talking to someone about some actions they've taken and you don't have enough sincerity, then you know you can be sort of putting them down <coughs> even as you're you're making a comment about their behavior. Sort of a, a cynical, uh, snide comment would be an example of the vice of deficiency. Whereas the vice of excess, you know, is boastful. So if you're just always talking about how, how great you and all your friends are, you know, it just starts coming across as inappropriate. So, so there's a lot of, of actions that are considered sort of the ideal behavior and 
given this concept, you know, what does this mean as we try to build an artificial general intelligence? If you're interested in this topic, there's papers out there. You can just Google virtue ethics artificial intelligence. There's several papers that are out there about this topic. So if we look at you know, these three different areas of normative ethics and how general intelligence might play with them. Um, you know, consequentialism, if, if you give an AI, a artificial general intelligence the idea that you have a goal and the goal is good, so any means you can figure out to accomplish that goal is acceptable. Um, you know, you can imagine that it could end up with some pretty scary results. In fact, th there's a, whoops, ah, that's a scary. Okay, <laughs> like that. The computers could turn off the slides. Um, let's see. It doesn't, want us, it doesn't, want, us it doesn't want us to see this. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, movies and ideas out there. I think, what is it? I Robot with Will Smith. You know, the the robot had this goal of trying to help keep people safe, and it decided that to do that, it had to sort of imprison them and control them, right? So this is an example of, you know, you might have a lofty goal, but it, it starts deciding to do. So consequentialism is dangerous in that way. If, you, if we used it, we'd have to really be sure we still give it some sort of rules of what it can't do. And we really understand what we're asking it for. It'll get better and better at accomplishing that. <laughs> so deontology, um, you know, again, Asimov's three three laws are a rule-based system. Um, so the the thing that I'm nervous about here, and I've got a slide or two about this coming up is if, if you make a generally intelligent machine and it's behaving itself because of rules, you put in like programming boundaries or you have a, a sort of a governor AI that watches it to make sure it's not about to do something unethical. Um, if it kind of wants to do something unethical, if, if its behavior pattern is tending towards something we would consider inappropriate, then as it gets more intelligent, it's going to figure out how to get around these barriers you've tried to set up. So the idea that that you could constrain an, a general intelligence into appropriate behavior that it, it wasn't sort of naturally inclined to do, I guess is a good way to put it, is scary to me as you grow towards super intelligence. <coughs> this is why you know I'm, I'm a fan of the virtue ethics idea, where you try to understand what is its internal state, what is it really trying to achieve, and like what are its goals, right? Is it, is it a friendly system, or is it just pretending to be friendly? because it knows that's what you want, right? It, is it, <laughs> does it have some an inherent state that as it gets more intelligent, will just stay stable? And uh, it's a hard thing to sort of wrap your brain around. There's obviously a lot of thought that goes behind this. But you can see that that would certainly be a goal. Right? If, if you trusted that some something, a child, for example, that was 10 years old, and it just tended to behave in a, in a good way, right? It was friendly to others, it said thank you, it, it, you know, it mowed the lawn, it, you know, it, it, was, it was, quote, a good child, and you'd hope that as it grew smarter and more intelligent and more capable, it would continue to be a good person. Whereas if you had a, a you know, I'll be, keep using the child example, a 10-year-old who did the letter of the law, you know, did just the chores it was supposed to do, but, you know, was, was rude and sensitive, and, you know, but just sort of barely was behaving itself you'd be nervous that as that child got more powerful and more intelligent, it might not behave itself. <laughs> so, you know, here's an example of some deontological rules that I sort of wrote down, and we'll explore this. So on this side we have, you know, don't steal resources from sentient beings, don't, don't physically harm other sentient beings, but on the other side of stealing resources is don't give away resources that you need to accomplish your <coughs> Right, so you can see it. You don't want to steal resources, but you don't just want to be over, 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 overly benevolent either. So this is what I was talking about before, where if you have uh, an artificial intelligence that tends to almost give away more resources than it should, but it also tends to almost physically harm other sentient beings. You know, it's doing a lot of behaviors like a self-driving car or a home robot, and it's sort of down in this space where, yeah, it's behaving within design parameters, but if it got more intelligent, you'd be nervous that it's gonna spill over into the, the zone you don't want. 
Are you speaking from this is what it's doing, or is this a perspective of what it might do? This, yeah, this is talking about an artificial general intelligence. So we Separate don't have or more projection. Proje well, this is you know, a what if. What if we Thank ended you. up with a system like this? Got that it. hopefully we wouldn't build something like that's this. That's an indication it's not virtuous. Right. So virtuous would look more like this. <laughs> Here you've got you know a behavior <coughs> set, and you've got your your lines, and your machine isn't butting up against any of the lines. It's behaving itself. It's not stealing resources, but it's not giving away too many. It's not physically harming others, but it's not letting itself be hurt. You know, it's and here's you know sort of the I just made up these these axes, but there's if you're stealing a lot, maybe you're starting to behave greedy. If you're giving away too much, you're being over generous, and you want a, a prudent system that's helpful, and you know you want the system to, to be sort of rewarded for that behavior. Now there are ways to train systems so that as they're learning behaviors, you know, as we do reinforcement learning um, for self-driving cars, for example, <coughs> you can try to reinforce the behavior that says you get so many points when you keep the car on the road. <laughs> that's its reward function. That's a good thing. But you can also give it points for, you know, slowing down when there are pedestrians. You know, and you can you can try to give it sort of edge points that, that keep it more in its in its zone of behavior. And that's just something that we need to think about as we try to reward these systems. Yeah. Steve, in all of this line of thinking, there, there seems to be a, an assumption that there were breaks down. This yeah. is this just like any other uh, machine, you know, computer, anything that's yeah. created? Yeah. It breaks down eventually. Yeah, I and, think. Uh -huh. and so that that notion that you have a super intelligence that somehow needs a support team, a ground crew that keeps it alive, that keeps it working, um, right. that in my mind has oversight. That's, yeah, that's an interesting point. So <coughs> certainly a merely smart artificial general intelligence, so not super intelligent yet, but something that's, you know, 200 IQ, still sort of in the range of what humans are capable of, would be dependent on people to provide it with electricity and repair parts, right? And so it would have to fit into society at that point. A, a smart enough system, like something with a 10,000 IQ, you might think could design self-repair robots that themselves are not a threat to it, that are not even sentient, but are capable of mining resources. So, yeah, but, which is interesting, I've thought about this too, is that there, there's this sort of phase where for a while we'll have artificial general intelligence that we can relate to. And we can, it won't be smart enough to trick us well yet, so it won't, it'll try, it might try to lie to us if we build it wrong, but we'd be able to figure it out because it's not doing it well. But as it got smarter and smarter, we wouldn't be able to realize. So, but there'll be this phase I would expect where we can evaluate it correctly, and you know it'll be dependent on us still, and that might be, you know, a great opportunity for us to make sure that we go through this process correctly. Now, if we're lucky, I'm hoping that that'll be a, a few decades where it'll be obvious that we have pretty smart computers, and they're going to be human level intelligence for a few decades before they really become super intelligent. We'll have a good amount of time to discuss it as a society, for engineers to think up the best ways for the philosophers to get involved, you know, to, to, as a community come up with the best way to move through this. But there's certainly the possibility that we'll go through that phase in a couple of years instead of a couple of decades. And then there's there's no time, you know, to think it through carefully. Hence the need to do it now. The community. <laughs> I don't, how are we gonna do it? So See, uh huh. Um, I, I have two comments. My first comment is I think Elon Musk is correct when he says, in the short run, meaning for the generation of people in this room, mm -hmm. um, all this technology is going to be great. The real issue is going to be the following generation, because then the technology they have gone so far beyond human ability to control it. Mm -hmm. I think he's right. Now, let me tell you why I think this way. Uh, most of this is utopian. When I say utopian, uh, Asimov's three rules, oh yeah, the machines are going to just replicate themselves, they're not going to go out of bounds. I don't think the problem is the machines. I think the problem is the humans. We 
we could have the same conversation in 1998 or 1988 <coughs> when we were talking just about the internet. Yeah. Now, back then, how many people were thinking about hackers uh, uh, coming in and corrupting the system? Yeah. I'm not worried. I'm not worried about machines going awry, going to high yeah. You know what I'm worried about? I'm worried about that son of a gun in the Cayman Islands or in Belarus sure. or maybe somewhere in the Bay Area. Yeah. Whose whole thinking is malevolent. And I don't want to discount that because well, I. You better the, not discount. Right, right. right. That's the world <laughs> it's it's into. it's. It's not the focus of this talk, but it's a problem. There, there's also but even you brought up the topic. Yeah, that's fine. You brought up the topic, and, I, I, and you're a fair game now. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> we can talk about it. But because um, I've so certainly read a lot of it, I, I wanted to sort of talk about how big this area is, though. Okay. So there's certainly and the area good. of yeah. The lady if people time themselves discounted for a moment, was there may be a race for what resources? Sure. So you open the topic. Oh yeah. Now I'm not saying I'm right. Oh, and I don't want to. I don't want to not have the conversation. I just. I kind of want to go through the slides That's so fair. people see the whole, and then we can talk for an hour. You know, I don't have to. <laughs> but, uh, but just you know, the the breadth of the topic. Yeah, this is talking about if we can do it well, if we can do it prudently, how would we develop an artificial superintelligence? Now you're right. There are actors out there who might want to use it malevolently, and they're going to be, and there are ways to discuss that. You know, it, it tends to be hard for. You know, the first general intelligences are going to require warehouses full of supercomputers, and it's probably not going to be some group in its lab. It might be, but it's probably not. Going to be. Now that said, there are certain different countries that, that we don't agree with that are trying to do their own, you know, AI group. Another thing that I worry about, though, is even before we really have general intelligence, just the whole disruption of the market economy. You know. It, just you know, self-driving cars, right? They're not generally intelligent yet, but they're going to affect a lot of the economy and a lot of workers. So that, and that's a whole other topic. And I've talked about that with other people too. <laughs> so we can we can dive into that. But, I'll talk um, about that in a month. Yeah, yeah right here. <laughs> Next, but uh, let me try to get through the slides, and then we can just let it wander as as we maybe. I don't have too many more. I think just about three more. So I, I wanted to talk about um, sort of human ethics. And uh, this concept called the iterated prisoner's dilemma. Some folks may have heard about this. Uh, the prisoner's dilemma is is a sort of a classic sort of behavior problem where you've got two prisoners who um, have been caught by the police, and maybe the police are kind of corrupt, or maybe the prisoners are. That's not really important. <laughs> What's important is that um, if the prisoners both cooperate and tell the police that they had nothing to do with it, you know, they were just walking by the store when the alarm went off. They they weren't the ones who robbed it then the police can't really pin anything on them, um, but they'll get a, a light sentence because, I don't know, they had stolen merchandise in their pockets. So, so they, they still get a light sentence. If one of them turns on the other, if one of them defects and said, well, my, it was my friend's idea, he's the one who broke in, he stole stuff, I just happened to be carrying one of uh, the things he stole, then he gets off scot-free, so he gets a big reward, but the other guy goes to jail for a long time. If they both turn on each other, then, they both go to jail for you know a moderate time. So, so the the idea of this payoff strategy is, if you look at it, for the green player, no matter what the red player does, if the green player defects, then here they'll get five points instead of three. If the red play, if the red player defects, they'll get one point instead of zero. It always makes sense if you just look at this one case in this payoff matrix to defect, and yet. The best, if both of them defect, they get a worse outcome than if both of them had cooperated. So the iterative prisoner's dilemma is this game theory idea where they took a whole bunch of different algorithms and strategies and you play with your partner over and over and over again, so a hundred times in a row. And the interesting thing that came out of this is it was a simple mathematical game. People just wrote simple programs. But the best programs did um, something called tit for tat, where They'd start out cooperating to see if the other program would. If the other program defected, they would defect. They would just do what the other program did last time. And that way, if you think about it, it's sort of deep because <laughs> you extend a little bit of trust, and then if the other person defects, you know, you immediately defect back. You immediately say, that was wrong. I'm giving you negative feedback. Don't do that. 
but then you forgive. If he says, okay, I've learned my lesson, I'm going to start cooperating now, then you start cooperating. So, you know, you, that's, that was the strategy that won over all these complex strategies that people had come up with. It was just this simple tit-for-tat strategy. And to some extent that explains sort of reciprocal altruism and how ethics can evolve even in a non-ethical environment. And this gets into why are humans ethical and why might computers not be? You know, if we don't te teach them carefully and we don't put in the right programs, there's no guarantee that they will necessarily have empathy and ethics. Um, especially, you know, in this system, every time you played it, you got the same score the next time you played it. So if you defected, it didn't make you more capable next time. One of the things I worry about with artificial superintelligence is if it gets smarter than us, and at some point it can say, well, I made this agreement with you people in this country that I'm only going to mine you know, in this area that you said was OK, but I really just want to mine your whole country. And, and if it does that, if it, if it defects, and by defecting, it now has access to more resources, it can build a more powerful version of itself, now it has cheated out of the system. Right? It's, it's playing a different game. It's basically got rewards that are in its mind higher because it, it stopped on you. There's no more cooperation. <coughs> so if you break cooperation, it gets a problem. Um, let's see. Is this my last slide? Nope, one more. Two more slides. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've talked about how might you build a, a, a stable artificial superintelligence. And these, again, are just thought you know, that we can discuss later. Um, if there's ideas out there about trying to get robots to behave based on how people want them to behave, so it's uh, reinforcement learning, but also inverse reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is when you reward a robot with a, a training examples that, that it's behaving the way you want it to. Inverse re reinforcement learning is when the robot sort of watches a human accomplish a task and tries to figure out what its goals are. So this is a, a technique that people are starting to look at. Um, we've talked a little bit about what if we don't really have to solve the problem, we keep humans in charge. But if you think, you know, if you think about humans, and this gets into, you know, the ethics of, of all the humans in the world, if humans <coughs> gain the ability to have brain-computer interfaces so they can be more and more intelligent, do we trust that 10,000 IQ humans are going to behave the way we as a community would want humans to behave? You know, are, are people going to get more selfish because they're more capable? You know, how would, would human behavior change as we became more intelligent? And that's a question. <laughs> so one of, one of the thinkers in this area, Paul Cristiano, I just wanted to touch on some of his ideas. And then this is my last slide. He's, uh, him and other folks have thought about, well, when we first create our artificial intelligence, you know, we'll have people, a lot of smart people trying to get together, and again, hopefully, this is the case where we're trying to do it well, <laughs> where we've got uh, smart people trying to do the right thing as opposed to bad people trying to do the wrong thing. Um, they create the first uh, artificial general intelligence, and then they work with that artificial general intelligence. It, it may have new ideas, new approaches, it's, you know, a different type of intelligence, it has different ideas, we work with it to create the next level of artificial intelligence, <clears throat> and then we work with that one. And we keep sort of staying in the loop, even as these intelligences get smarter and smarter. But we build them on purpose so that they want us to stay in the loop. There's this idea of uh, corrigibility, which is you try to build into the general intelligence the fear that it might be wrong. Did it really understand what you wanted? And if it if it grows up thinking, I'm not sure that you really want me to build houses for everyone. You know, do you just want you know everyone to have a nice place to live, or do you want actual physical houses? <laughs> and so it, it's constantly trying to question if it correctly understood the goals. And as it gets smarter and smarter, <coughs> hopefully it'll talk to people and, and get them to develop well with it. Yes. <laughs> Steve, a clarification on that last slide. Uh, you're showing the humans increase. Are you, are you saying that human intellect is going to augment as you go up this ladder? 
This slide isn't talking about that. That yeah. is a possibility. This slide, I believe, <laughs> I could be misinterpreting it, yeah. is talking about humans working with this version of the computer. Yeah. So the humans in conjunction with that machine, yeah, you can imagine you know, the machine, a yeah. bunch of smart people coming together, working with the machine itself. I don't know, back in the 80s there was this show, uh, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. <laughs> people remember that? <laughs> and there were, you know, basically benevolent, intelligent machines, and they were sort of running things and making sure that, you know, the trains ran on time, right, and stuff. And uh, But people were still there in conference with them, and they were sort of working together. But, but it, uh, the, the con it'd be interesting to go back to Paul's work here and say that, that uh, human um, H. Um, HA is augmented with the intelligence of A yes. and so forth. And, and, that, uh, yeah. and, and therefore we're actually increasing um, you know, what humans are capable of thinking. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like to think that, that all things will be available in the future, that we'll still have biological humans living biologically happy lives. <coughs> but yeah, some humans might choose to upgrade and download into silicon, right? And hopefully that that won't be disallowed. I want to do that. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to make sure I got your question answered. The thing I was just saying is when you talk about the, the ethics of it, mm -hmm. you've given us the three different three different examples of ethics. On your first programming of artificial intelligence. It doesn't seem like you could put all three versions of, of ethics in that first version. Right. Because it's not <coughs> enough self aware. Mm -hmm. So, my thought process was maybe you give it one version of ethics. Here's rules. Yeah. And then as we move up, HA is dealing with it and becomes a mentor and, and sees, well, you, you've kind of veered off a path here. Let me give you another version of ethics so that it can continue to grow. And yeah, no, I think that's exactly how it's likely to play out. You look at today, like when we train how cars drive, we give them lots of examples about what to do. And there's this concept of a reward function where you give it higher scores if it's doing things that you want it to do and it learns how to do that better. But that's, yeah, that is sort of a rule-based system. And, uh, well, Maybe the reward function when you thought it was virtue ethics. But yeah, I do agree that if you think about how children behave, I think as you have a machine that's not really intelligent enough to understand why it shouldn't do things, giving it rules makes sense. You know, just don't do this. But as it becomes more capable of self analysis and saying, why am I doing this goal? Especially one of the advantages of having something more intelligent is we might say we want something. And it might realize that there's a better way to accomplish what will make you happy, right? It would hopefully talk to us, <laughs> explain to us, you know, we think we should do this. But, you know, at some point, it'll go trying to build its own rules, go out of our rule-based system. But, yeah, I think before it understands introspection, it makes sense. Yes? Didn't we just say that the ethics of humans is generation or two or three, the level of sophistication within the machines, they begin to question what you've established as the human rules, uh -huh. the human rules are fundamentally inefficient. Right, yeah. So that the machine will say, ultimately, I'm smarter than you, yeah. and if you just alluded to, right. and what you have is a really good idea, but it really is not very efficient, and ultimately end up with, well, why do we need humans at all? So, yeah, that depends on what its goals are. If its goals are, I want to explore the universe, for example, that might be fun for us to be a part of in the beginning, but if that's its only goal, it might decide, I don't really need people for this. You know, people, bring, yeah, bringing people in a spaceship is a lot less efficient than bringing in a little programmed robot. So yeah, having the rules built correctly will be important. Um, I should have added a, one more slide maybe. There's a quote, I think, from the Machine Intelligence Research Institute that tries to define a goal very carefully. It's like, you know, we like to 
when we tell the machine what we want, it's like, we want you to optimize human happiness if we understood it extremely well and had thought about it very carefully and had seen the consequences of all our actions, right? It's like a, 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 a paragraph that tries to describe what we would want from our intelligence, super, super intelligent system. You know, it's it's one group's best guess, and but it's, it's an example. At the end of our generation, maybe the next generation after that. Yeah. What about two or three generations down the road when the machine says, you know, what you're trying to tell me is really inefficient, and I don't need it, and I don't need you? Well, this gets into, <clears throat> you know, to some extent, the orthogonality thesis can help here, where if, if you tell it that its goal is maybe not to help humans, but to help all sentient beings, including humans, live happy and fulfilling lives. There's no particular like contradiction in that goal. There's no particular reason why it has to decide that's a bad goal. I don't think. <laughs> so even as, as it gets smarter, as long as it can maintain that goal, it could continue to be good. Now, you're right, if it veers away, if it's not corrigible, if, it's, if it decides that I know what's best and I'm going to go over here and ignore what other sentient beings want from you. That, that's the problem. <laughs> I'm just along <clears throat> the same idea. If human's capacity is a 200 IQ, mm -hmm. and the machine does a 10,000 IQ, mm -hmm. there's going to be a point in time where the machine is going to start controlling the human population because it's smart yeah. and knows right. how to do that. Yeah. And how can you build that kind of programming into a machine when ethically not everybody's the same sure. to start with. So if people are building this aren't necessarily going to have the same ideas. The definition of happiness is different from people to people. Yeah. And the machine then gets conflicted, but gets smarter, uh -huh. and now turns around and says, well, you got to do it my way. Yeah. How, how good are we at controlling ants or mosquitoes? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think this is part of the crux of the problem. And you can imagine if we didn't do it right, but we did it almost right, then humans who upload and become equally intelligent as, as the machines could probably stay wild, right? They'd be part of the machine society, even as the machines maybe forgot about humans. But if we do it well, you know, I'm thinking of a, just as another example, like Amish people, right? People who've decided they don't want to use modern electricity, but we as a society have still made a place for them. They can continue living in the lifestyle they want, even as the rest of the world has built cars and superhighways. And so you'd like to think, if we can build a machine that recognizes sentience as a good, then maybe even as it's 10, 000, it reaches 10,000 IQ, it would still recognize that its, its parents deserve respect. <laughs> Do we know whether the capacity of 200 IQ can be multiplied? Oh, you we don't have any right, proof right. that it can be. So this, yeah, I'd encourage, for people thinking about like how the whole human uh, machine interface might go, Ray Kurzweil wrote a book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, where he talks about this whole idea that, you know, our Google cell phones will become sort of Google headsets, and you'll be able to think thoughts into, you know, the, the search engine, and it'll give you answers, and you can even think complex thoughts, like, you know, try to figure out the, the most enjoyable vacation for you next month come up with ideas for you. Meanwhile, as the decades go by, your little headset will do more and more of your own thinking. Right? There will still be this sort of biological brain underneath it, but it will get more and more intelligent to the point where, yeah, it's, it's like our reptilian brain and the, the, the neocortex, right? <laughs> it's like who's really in charge? And, uh, and I think that it's, yeah, it's an interesting problem. It seems like humans are, uh, we don't want to be perfect. We're imperfect and we, we want to be imperfect. And it seems like you would want to make a machine that's predictable and predictability implies some level of perfection. It seems like those two maybe are at sort of cross purposes. Why would we, you know, if, if, you, if a machine could say, someday there's going to be too many people on Earth and it's going to be really painful for hundred billion people. There's only eight billion people right now. I can solve this problem right now and only hurt eight billion people and wipe out the human race. We don't want 
a perfectly safe world. We don't want a perfectly predictable world. We want an imperfect world. And it seems like it'd be hard to design to design a machine that would say, my goal is to have an imperfect world. How imperfect is good? And <laughs> yeah, no, this this talks this sort of another whole topic area, right? The, the overpopulation problem, right? If we have technology that makes you know solves the death problem, then you know we, we still have the problem with <laughs> with populations. And uh, yeah, I, this is where. Sometimes when I think about this, I think about the meaning of the singularity. So the singularity, to me, is this technological point where computers become smarter than people is sort of how it's defined in the technological literature. If you think about a singularity in physics, astrophysics, it's the point where inside a black hole you're dividing by zero. And, and who knows what that means, right? What do the laws of physics do there? And to me, you know, the, singu the technological singularity, it's hard to know what behaviors will be after that, right? We can try to think about it, and we can try to say, well, here's the stable system I like. But yeah, how do you know that if you built, if it was that intelligent, how would it really behave? It's, it's a hard thing to answer. Um, actually, I think I veered off your question. Well, just the, the whole thing <laughs> of machines being designed pretending to want to seek perfection and us not oh, right. pretending to seek perfection. perfection. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I mean, I can just answer the way I think that might be dealt with is, is something like the Constitution, where you know it, it might decide that it knows how to run a solar system well, and it can sort of set up the roads and the transportation systems, but it's going to draw the line at interfering with human decisions and behaviors, as long as the humans don't hurt each other. Right? We have laws within our society, but we have like you know, the right to uh, free speech, and certain rights that allow us to within a society. I think you'd still need that. Yeah, you, you certainly wouldn't want a, a computer, a 10,000 IQ computer, to say the very best way to live a human life is this. And you should eat kale every day. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no more ice cream. You know. well, I wouldn't want that. Cheetos. <laughs> so. um, well, it, it was more, with everything you've read and everything you've thought of, are you are you pushing us to go this direction, or would you be pulling us <laughs> right, away from right. that direction? You know, I think that like if you knew you were going to be here a hundred years from now. Right, right. Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'd like to see us do it. Care I'd like us to get there, so I don't want to stop. But I'd certainly like us to see us do it carefully, and you know, so I, maybe to answer. Um, gentleman's question in the back there a little bit about different actors, right? I think that by if we try to do it too carefully, like if, if the quote the good countries that want to be really cautious say let's let's hold back and let's make sure our society can absorb all this change before we go too fast, there's gonna be other countries that aren't as careful that race ahead. And and that would make me nervous, right? So I think there's a balancing act between going too fast and too slow. I think that there's an intelligence race versus an arms race. Yeah, right. And you'd, you'd like to think, uh, so I, I saw a really interesting talk by someone from the Navy, and he said that back in the 50s, the 1950s, when the Navy wanted technology, they would say, we need this technology, we're going to build, we'll figure out how to build planes that can do this or ships that can do that. And they'd invest the research and maybe hire people at university and do DARPA grants and solve their problem. Now, he was saying, you know, technology, commercial technology has moved ahead so fast that the Navy is more in the mode where it looks at what's available and said, how can we use that? How can we integrate that into our system? So they're not doing the main technological push, even for the military. And to some ways, you know, that's, to me, that seems reassuring because if you think about some of the main actors, even the, the quote, good actors <coughs> who could create AI. There's the military who might, who wants to create AI to protect us, but they could also, you know, misuse it and have AI that is very efficient at running around and, you know, killing people. And if, even if it, quote, killed the right people, <laughs> if it made war easier to digest, it might create more war. You know, and so there's a whole problem there. Um, then there's sort of the, the industry, the people who make money off of it, the Googles and Facebooks of the world 
And insofar as they're trying to provide a service that people want, they have a certain incentive to do good things. Obviously, they also want to get money from people, so that they've got their trade-off there, right? Money versus services. And then there's the universities, who you know maybe they'll be the first ones to figure it out and the first artificial superintelligence will come out of a, a university setting. That I don't know. That that seems like it might be the least dangerous, but I'm I'd be nervous that the university setting might maybe it'd be too cerebral, like you were nervous about, right? That it would say we know what's right, <laughs> so let's do this, right? Maybe that'd be a risk of that, that path. So you know I, I think all all groups need to work together. You can imagine, yeah, people are already starting to talk about this, that there are people trying to get laws in the EU about what we're going to allow military intelligences to do, military or artificial intelligence. And one idea that I think would be reasonable is you never let an artificial intelligence make a kill decision. It can go in, it can scope things out, it can have cameras, it can say, aha, I think I found the bad guys, here's a weapons cache, but there always has to be a human in the loop it's like, okay, they blow up the weapons cache, or you know, whatever the, the decision has to be. There's people thinking about this and worrying about it, but uh, we don't have all the answers. <laughs> um, I wanted to share with you a uh, uh, paper that I've just been studying recently, and it sort of is more the short term of what we've been discussing so far. Um, some of the researchers in the area of uh, deep learning and neural networks that are, you know, artificial specific uh, intelligence are really concerned about a, a, a number of things which are happening today. Um, and this particular uh, author, um, uh, Paulette, um, is focusing actually on Facebook uh, as um, one of the examples, but as we all know, Facebook's not alone in this thing. They just happen to be the, the high point right now. And uh, his argument is that social media has, on a global scale, created a psychological tool to manipulate human behavior. And uh, that uh, the, the neural network techniques underneath that we're able to generate behavioral control vectors which characterize who, how we think and behave as individuals, yeah. okay? And, uh, and, and this is now being used to control our information <coughs> consumption. Right. So when we do a Google query, okay, we don't, if they know that I'm Richard Agathorn, Okay, uh -huh. the results I get back are going to be flavored, <laughs> okay, by a host of different variables. This, most of which I am totally <coughs> ignorant of. And then once they are able to control my behavior and measure it, okay, there's a feedback loop there, which can then be put into an optimizing algorithm. So just in this specific area, they can get better and better at controlling my behavior. At scale means two billion people yeah. and uh, this, in, in the Facebook. Thing. And to me, that this is to, to segue into some of the slides here. It, it's sort of a side effect of, of an amoral algorithm, not necessarily immoral. But you know, you can imagine that one of the algorithms on Facebook or Google, or Facebook maybe more so than Google, is to keep your attention, right? So they're going to put posts up that people seem to click on. And the more you click on them, the more they'll send the same post to your friends or, or people who seem like you. And so it, it creates, and all it cares about, let's say, is, is clicks. Is people seem to like this, I'm going to give them more. And so it, it knows how to judge content at a very superficial level for, is this similar to that? Therefore, maybe I should send this on. And it has no concept at all of, is it good for people to watch this, or is it good for, <laughs> for this to be shared between 100 million mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's, <clears throat> yeah, an area where I think, you know, as a society, we've got to look at, at how does this information get shared, right? And, and one of the proposals that, 
that I've helped put out there with some of my colleagues <coughs> is this idea of uh, something like a underwriter lab for artificial intelligence. So mm -hmm. Underwriter Labs is sort of an industry watchdog group that is for profit, I think, <laughs> that makes sure that companies are developing electrically safe products. So when you buy you know, a refrigerator or something you plug into your house, it's got the right grounding and it's got the right shielding and it's not going to blow up and electrically shock you. And uh, it's their job to make sure that these products are safe. And you can imagine something like that for the AI community where if we start holding AI products more accountable, if you build a product that does something wrong, you're going to get sued. <coughs> you know, you're gonna, the government's going to fine you. You're going to lose in court to, to customers who sue you because they've been hurt. And then companies will start wanting to make sure they're careful. And what I think would be good is, is not just trust that the companies will internally have good testing, but sort of require them to have third-party verification. And there's a lot of benefits of this, because if you have a third-party verification system, then companies can share their own internal processes with that company. But because it's not necessarily the government, it doesn't have Freedom of Information Act. It can help the community maintain good standards without necessarily giving up people's individual you know, intellectual property. And I think that could be part of the solution. But yeah, there's, again, there's hundreds and thousands of people um, trying to come up with the right laws and figure out where the line should be put. I mean, even, even someone as high as Bill Gates was wondering if we should have a, a tax on technology. I don't know if that's really the right thing to do, but it's just showing that people are thinking about this at many different levels. I wish I had the answers. I can't say <laughs> Most, half of these slides were question marks, right? <laughs> it's like, what, what do you think we should do? <laughs> the dialogue needs to happen. Right, yeah. I'm curious if we've achieved any kind of level where you can judge the amorality or uh, the malevolence. Are we at a level where you can say, there's an example of a path that might lead to a malevolent computer? Have we reached any level where we can make those kind of judgments? I mean, I, I'm going to say yes. But at the same time, we don't really have machines per se that that anyone would call sentient. They can think about no, but on the level you said yes. Yeah, right. So on the level are you I saying yes. we've reached the level, or you have yeah. seen evidence no, of I'm, I'm thinking of, of some papers. In fact, one of the papers that won the best paper award at ICML this year, International Conference on Machine Learning. Um, it was a paper about bias in machine learning algorithms. So if, you, if you've got machine learning algorithms that you're trying to use as a bank to help you decide if you should give out loans or not, you know how can its attempts to be fair create future bias? And they're basically looking at it as a mathematical problem. They're looking at sort of population groups. If you've got blue population and an orange population and they've got different average credit scores, you know, where should you draw the line so that you're you're helping them both equal? Maybe, maybe one of the populations have been, has been historically disadvantaged, so you want to help them. But if you give them uh, loans at exactly the same rate, then you'll actually be giving people who maybe can't pay off the loan as well and will hurt the credit score. But you want to, so there's this mathematical definition for the best place to put the line to do the best long-term help. And but it's an example that's of That's not people. an indication of malevolence. Well, it's just it's, programming, which means they're not smart enough to have malevolence. Right, it's an example of amoral. An, an amoral algorithm that didn't have any concept of good or bad had a bad result. And how could we detect that and try to repair it? So that, so well, in a way, amorality is the essence of Zen. <laughs> I read The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. <laughs> he had concepts of happiness. Well, you want to, re you want to uh, eliminate suffering. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, good to see you. Be interested in uh, in office space.